Saturday. Uh, I hope that it's a profitable day. I've been looking forward to this. Uh, it wasn't even that long ago that we as a staff uh, began discussing what uh, some leadership training we could do could look like together, and we kind of threw it all uh, all together very quickly. And, and I hope you don't really sense that. I hope that doesn't get in the way uh, of, of your experience here today. Um, but we've got some really neat things planned, and the content, I hope, especially in the workshops, will be good. I'm ringing a little bit, but get back. Get back. I'm moving back up. I'm moving to go all the way. <laughs> See, this is what happens when you know, no one sits in the front. i got to come closer. Um, we're going to have a good day, and I really hope that, uh, uh, that you sense God speaking and directing and calling you, and you get excited about your ministry. I'm very excited about all the different ministries that are represented here. We have people from all of our campuses. Uh, we have children's workers here. We have youth workers here. We have life group leaders here. And you may have come today not even in one of those ministries, but you just want to learn, and I just think that's awesome. Uh, we're going to talk about um, a, uh, an understanding of leadership and the function of leadership within the church that I hope is, um, is, is something that, that you can wrap your head around and that you can figure out how to contextualize. Um, and so uh, that's, that's the purpose of today, is to make sure you have not just the tools, but also the toolbox uh, to be confident as you serve the church and serve the ministry. I'm going to pray, and then we're just going to go over a bit of the schedule. Father God, uh, we come before you now uh, by the blood of Jesus and through the power of the Holy Spirit. We ask that you would uh, direct our time, that uh, uh, you would direct it today because we know that you have plans for our church. You have plans for our church to uh, experience the, the deep grace of, of the cross, to share that deep grace uh, with, a, with a world, with a city, with cities that, uh, that need to hear it. I pray, Lord, today that uh, you would excite us, that you would inspire us, that you would challenge us, Lord, that, that uh, we would uh, be united in, in our purpose, and that we would be united in the passion we have for this. I ask that you would remove any distractions from that um, from this time together. Uh, and that uh, you would just uh, just be speaking to each one of us individually. In your name I pray. Amen. Put his hand up to the back. Did you get one? Yes. You're going to be inundated with paper. That was one of the things. I would have loved to have done binders for you. Um, and done a whole big package up, like a conference, a fancy conference, and we get the name tags. And, and uh, so it's not going to happen this year. Next year we will. Um, and you're going to hold me to that. I'm going to come back next year. Yeah, you know how I said last year? Um, we would do binders. But um, make sure you get it. And, uh, and be just taking notes as you feel comfortable. Um, the schedule is on the front there. And what we're going to try to do is, is try to keep all of our sessions to around 45 minutes. Uh, that gives me 32 right now because we are already got into my time. But um, after each session today, this morning, we're going to have some breakouts. You've seen those there. We've advertised those. We have three. Um, uh, Jordan is going to be doing one on how to deprogram your small group. Uh, Paul, Pastor Paul, is going to be in the youth room uh, talking about evangelism and how to reach people and reach people, how to share the gospel with others. Kirsten's going to be teaching a session on how people change. And you're going to be able to take part in two of those three, okay? Um, sorry, but that's how the schedule kind of works. So uh, I'd just be thinking now of the ones that you'd like to participate in. If you wanted to take in uh, uh, one of them twice, hey, it's your world. I'm just trying to live in it. Um, do your thing and, uh, and, and just be thinking about that. Uh, at around 12.15 or so, we're going to uh, break for lunch. Chef Dave Cologne uh, is making us lunch, and you're going to smell it very soon, and it is going to be very, very happy, all right, and uh, we're going to have a time of fellowship uh, upstairs, uh, having a meal together, after that, uh, we'll do a final main session um, with one another, and then uh, I'm hoping to get you out of here before too, sound all right? Yes. yes. All right, yeah. any questions? Okay, no, hey, here's how today's going to work, yeah, yeah. oh. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> you rolled his eyes, okay, I'm just going to give quick lunch instructions, because I don't know if we have a main session right sure. before. Um, we're going to serve the food downstairs, and then so you don't have to eat in a dingy church basement, you're going to bring it back up here to eat, and you can eat, we'll put some chairs out in the foyer or in here, um, so you're just going to file down the stairs, take as much food as you want, and then come back up to eat. Thank you. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Any questions on lunch? <laughs> 
It's at 12 15 minutes, three hours. Yes, Leslie. Um, so you talk about these um, uh, outbreak things. Do we get a chance to, to that each of them to explain a little bit about what their, their little group means or nothing? I wrote all the titles. So <laughs> 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 You want to hear from each one what they're going to cover? No, no, no. Well, sure. Just a, Here, I'll tell you. Jordan, Jordan is going to make fun of Bible studies. No, I'm just kidding. That is not so bad. He's all red now. And all red now and all red now and you can email me at Jordan at place to belong No, uh, uh, that session will, will be really just kind of trying to take our groups from from the extremes of being social, uh, or being intellectual, and trying to combine community and the word uh, for transformation. And so he's going to talk about what that means. Um, Kirsten's is going to be about how people really experience the, uh, the power of the word and the power of the gospel in their lives and some of those kinds of things. Paul is uh, just going to give you some good, solid truths about how to share the gospel within our culture. Right? Is that okay? I've now spoken for three people, <laughs> one of whom I'm married to, and uh, this, is, it, this is starting off with a good thing. Okay, um, and they'll, they'll, it'll be good. I've seen most of the material, it's, it's, it's great. Any other questions? really want to make sure that we get a chance to ask questions to interact with the material. I would encourage you to take notes. I would encourage you after each session to um, grab on to one thing that you want to remind yourself about tomorrow. Uh, grab on to one thing that you want to share about this week with somebody else and grab on to one thing that you want to change in this next season and, and then I hope that, that this is not just for a day and we can, uh, we can kind of take this into our ministries through the week. I want to start today by going to uh, 1 Peter chapter 2 and I hope you brought a Bible and you can open it up there or you're at um, uh, and we're going to start talking about leadership uh, from a position of our own identities. Uh, and who we are in Christ, because it's out of our experience of the gospel that we uh, that we share the gospel with other people. Uh, I'm a firm believer that as the Spirit works in us and to make Jesus glorified in our lives, He does that not so that we can keep it to ourselves, but so that we can share it with other people. He says, Peter does in First Peter two nine, you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for His own possession that you might proclaim the excellencies of Him who called you out of darkness into the marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Uh, that's the, that's uh, our status before God. And, and today, I'm going to be talking about uh, what leadership looks like, what incarnational leadership looks like. Uh, by incarnation, I mean what did Jesus show us in His leadership that we can replicate and, and it really locks in on this passage because we're going to talk about three different functions of a leader. That a leader uh, functions as a priest, as someone who brings people into the presence of God. We see that there. You are a royal priesthood. Uh, we don't. Uh, we we hold very dear to this in our in our Protestant tradition that that everyone has equal access to God. Uh, and with that equal access to God, we can come into His presence, and we can come with confidence and come with expectation. And then we get this amazing privilege that we can bring other people into His presence through a royal priesthood. We believe that that one of the functions uh, of a leader is that of a prophet, and I'll unpack that a little bit later. But I want to emphasize small p prophet, okay? so that we're not worried about throwing stones at one another. Okay. Um, and, and that's the idea of, of proclaiming truth. We see that in this passage. That you may proclaim the excellencies of Him who calls you out of darkness into a marvelous light. And that idea that, that we have this chance to really testify and witness uh, the resurrection, uh, the work of God in our lives is wonderful and powerful. We get to proclaim the excellencies of Him who called us out of darkness into a marvelous light. We're ambassadors, we're witnesses, we're speaking about the one. We're not trying to draw as leaders people to ourselves, we're not trying to glorify ourselves, we're not trying to puff up our egos. None of you are here because you want to do that. And so it's not about platform, it's really about servanthood. 
And Jesus said that the Son of Man did not come to serve, but to be served. No, did not come to be served, but to serve. <laughs> to give his life as a ransom for many. <laughs> Key distinction. Uh, but a wonderful distinction. And, and we have this chance, this opportunity, this privilege to, to see how the gospel is spoken, declared, and demonstrated. Uh, can change people's lives. And then finally, uh, we do this together and we do this strategically. Uh, he says, you are a chosen nation, a royal priesthood. But there's a, there's a new culture, there's a kingdom that we're a part of and that we get to invite other people to be a part of as well. And so part of being a leader is that we function as, as kings. And again, small k, king, uh, where we're looking to strategically advance the kingdom. Uh, and, and, and that's what I thought would be really helpful for you, uh, and because I know it's been helpful for me, as we uh, begin to work together to minister to people to the same ends. Uh, what we want to see is disciples made, and disciples who make disciples. How are we doing that? We're doing that by declaring and demonstrating the transforming power of the gospel. Amen. That's what we expect to see. Uh, I thought, though, we would start with, um, start with some theology. 2 Corinthians 5, 16, from now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh, even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh. We regard him that way no longer. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All of this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, that in Christ, uh, he gave us, that is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them. And entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Verse 20, this is what we want to underline. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him to be sin, who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Here we see what God has done for us and what God is doing through us. Here we see uh, the work of God in our own lives that we want to share with the world that we're moving through. Leadership at SCC, I would love it if we would just grab onto this. Because this is Spirit-led. Uh, what I mean by Spirit-led is the Spirit is always making much of Jesus. And we want to have a strong, we want to have a strong uh, understanding and reliance on the Holy Spirit. Because that's how we know Jesus. Uh, we want it to be incarnational. We want, we want Jesus to kind of be known. By incarnational, what I mean is, is that, that we can see God, that we can see Jesus in the flesh, in one another, in word and in deed. Finally, we want it to be missional. We want it to have purpose. Uh, that, I believe, is, is when we're being Trinitarian in our approach. We know that the Father sent the Son, that God has a plan to bring about the redemption of the world. He started that plan uh, through Jesus at the cross, and He's reminding, about it, uh, reminding us by it and empowering us with it through the Holy Spirit. Um, that's where I want to take it and, and move uh, with it today. And, and I've got a whole bunch of diagrams, and I'm really excited. <laughs> I just dig on diagrams. And, and, uh, and I'm hoping you follow along. Um, I, I believe that God... In, in giving us an understanding of theology, knows that, knows that uh, we need it to be simple. For me, he knows that I need it to be simple. And so uh, he puts it into threes for me. Um, I don't know about you, I've said this before, but if I go to the store and I've got to pick up three things, I'm good. But I have to pick up four, I'm going to forget two. Right? Uh, anybody else like that? Yeah, okay, yeah no, all the men in the room. And, and I think that's why God has kind of given us an understanding of theology uh, with threes. And, and, and that's how we know Him, right? You'll see, notice these diagrams on your page. That God, there's this oneness in three persons. We know that with the Trinity, right? Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Okay? Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Uh, that God is one God, we understand Him though in three persons. Uh, a wonderful truth that, that uh, we see uh, brought out in Scripture. We know that the Son, uh, the Son Jesus, in His incarnation, um, came to give us a gospel, came to show us Himself. And that gospel uh, declares Him as the God-man incarnation, atonement, I was just saying, I, uh, I write in tongues, okay? So if you can't understand it, someone else will interpret it for you. 
Um, and sometimes we do two things, all right? And resurrection. The three most important days on the church calendar are what? We celebrate two of them. Easter. Yeah, Easter. Yeah. Christmas. Pentecost. Pentecost. And Good Friday. We see all of that in here. Okay. Um, we don't do Pentecost real well. We do Baptist. That freaks us out. I'm hoping we can reclaim that. Um, out of that, we see Jesus in his function, in his incarnation in three ways. And this is what we're going to spend time uh, working on. Okay? Uh, that, that he comes and he provides, he shows us the office of God as king, as prophet, and as priest. This is the incarnation. Okay? That Jesus, in his ministry to us, comes as the king, comes as the priest, and comes as the prophet. That's why he said, I have not come to abolish the law and the prophets, I have to come to fulfill them. And so then when we look and we say we want to be a church that is his body, that incarnates him, uh, that's, that's what we want people to experience Jesus as. That it's by him that we get to the Father as our priest. That it's by him that we hear from God as prophet. And that it's by him that he's guiding and directing and leading our church uh, to advance the kingdom moving forward. Does that make sense? Okay. Well, that's where we're going to spend our time um, in these main sessions throughout today, uh, especially as we talk about the practicalities of leadership. But these, these triangles got me really excited, so I added two more. Okay. Um, and then we see out of that, the church, the church has primarily um, three uh, main functions. It's worship, community, and mission. Okay. That's a united body. That's community. Um, and then we want that to affect people. And what do we want it to affect? We want it to affect their hearts, their minds, and their wills. It's that balance, and that's why I inverted your triangles, was to kind of show the balance. It's this balance that, 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 we're, that we want to move uh, towards together with. We want to be balanced in our approach. Um, we want to proclaim um, these wonderful truths of theology, and I could do, and somebody could write volumes of books on this or teach uh, for hours on these things. And, and oftentimes what I like to do is see how they're all kind of concentric triangles, you know, they're all united together with one. And we get from God to the person through the means of Jesus, through it by the church, and into the hearts of people. Um, and that's what we want to see happen. We want to see lives be transformed by the gospel. Any questions on, on this? Does it kind of make sense? Okay. Um, it's not heretical? That's me. Okay, good. All right. All right, we're winning. Let's talk about leaders king. Okay, now, this idea um, uh, is a difficult one because because most people are humble. We don't want to we don't want to say I'm the king. I'm the I'm the guy. In fact, uh, when we're thinking this way, we're really thinking of fun as function. Jesus functions in this office. These are his offices. These aren't our offices. Okay, and I think that's a really key distinction that we need to make. Because it's all about him. Um, we don't want to be saying, I'm a prophet. Okay? Because that's a very dangerous thing. <laughs> if you say things as a prophet, um, the Bible says if you're wrong, that's trouble. Okay? What we do want to do is function in the perspective of proclaiming truth to people so that they can hear from God. We know that prophecy is a spiritual gift. It doesn't make someone a prophet. It just is a function and a gift mix that says they're communicating God's truth to people uh, so that He would be glorified and the people would respond and change. Even with the idea of priesthood, we see in spiritual gifts, there's, there's, there's gifts that are kind of priestly gifts, gifts of mercy 
uh, gifts of discernment, uh, gifts of edification, where we come into one another's lives so that so that we can help them connect with God. And then we see this, this belief that, that if the kingdom is advancing and God is directing and God is guiding and God is moving amongst us and we want to be wise stewards of that mission. Okay, And that mission is to see the kingdom advance, to see it go worldwide, to see it go global. Uh, so we're not talking about offices. We're talking about some functions. And we as leaders, whether we're in children's ministry, youth ministry, life group, uh, whether we're working with uh, people uh, in compassion ministry, uh, we need to be thinking about all three of these things because this is how we show Jesus and communicate Christ to those we oversee. When we talk about the king, we're talking about the, the, the idea of, of directing people towards a bigger picture. Um, you know the big picture? You know the big picture? Any big picture thinkers in the room? You can put up your hand. Yeah, we, there's people who think about the big picture. Where are we going? What are we doing? It? Why are we doing it? That why piece is a big one. Why are we doing this? Where are we going? How are we going to get there? Someone needs to ask that question, don't you think? Someone needs to be the one who's wrestling with that question. I've given you a bit of a diagram of what the big picture is there. And again, it's another time. Okay? It kind of shows uh, the interaction that we have between the world and the church, uh, culture uh, and the church, if you will, and the gospel. And, and again, we want to be in balance because how those things interact with one another is very profound. We want the church to be experiencing the redemption of the gospel. And that's why we proclaim it. Uh, Romans 5 says, I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation for the Jew and the, Gen the Greek. Okay? Now what are we reading into that? It's for the religious person and the irreligious person alike. That's why we proclaim the gospel to the church. It's not just, it's not just a form of evangelism. You know what I mean? When I was a kid, uh, we only ever talked about the gospel uh, when that afternoon our youth pastor was taking us on the streets with five spiritual laws packets. Today we're going to go share the gospel. We never did that at any other time. We never talked about the gospel realities in our own life. But as we read the New Testament, Paul keeps calling the churches back to an experience of the gospel because it's by the gospel that we experience the presence of God, the promises of God, the power of God that we become the people. Uh, and so the big picture is tying in, in what we're doing at church and how that interacts with the world. And there needs to be a certain level of integration, don't you think? We need to be empowering people to go into the world and make disciples. Jesus said that, one of his last words. Go into all the worlds and make disciples, and I will be with you. Baptize them, teach them, show them me. Uh, and, and that's what we want to be doing. And we're doing that by the power of the gospel in our lives because we actually will have something to witness to when we're experiencing it. If the power of the gospel is to break the power of sin, to break the power of Satan, and to break the power of death, that is something that, that I think we can, we can share with the world without hesitation, without embarrassment. Finally, we want to be expecting transformation that as the gospel is proclaimed in the culture, that that is happening. That's, that's the whole purpose. Now, Anytime we gather as a church, we want to keep the big picture in mind. We want to keep where we are in this, in, in this paradigm in mind. Um, and whether we're teaching a Sunday school class downstairs, it's, it's not just so the kids will understand the Bible better. That's a very, very good thing, a very, very important thing. We want them to understand the Word because by it, they will know Jesus. And if they know Jesus, they'll take that into the world. If they know Jesus, they'll take that into their homes. If they know Jesus, people will be built up and people will be saved. And so what you do with kids in a church basement on a Sunday for 20 minutes every week matters in the advancement of the kingdom. Isn't that awesome? Woo! Yeah, it's a really, really big deal. It's not just something we're doing so that they won't be loud in the sanctuary. Okay? It makes a difference on Sunday morning. On Sunday mornings, we just don't want to communicate truth without an expectation that people will be transformed by that truth. 
On Wednesday, Thursday morning, ladies Bible studies, the whole purpose is so that we would understand the Word of God as spoken from the Word and from one another, that we might be able to share it with, with, the, with the people in our lives. Uh, there was 120 kids here on the week on Tuesday. They all actually drove to Sick Moose in a bus. 120 high school kids. That's larger than most churches. You understand? That's a lot of people. And that's a lot of trouble that could happen. Okay? And they went into that community and overwhelmed that community. And those kids are finding in their relationship with one another, in friendship, in fellowship, a safe place so that when they go into the world, they would know they're loved and cared for, that they have a place where they belong. All of that kind of matters, all that kind of connects. And so when we're thinking about the big picture, we're thinking about those kinds of things. What makes up a kingdom? Um, a medieval kingdom, if you want to think about it. Think of all those movies that you've watched, kind of Robin and the Braveheart. What makes up a kingdom? I think there's four things that just generally make up a kingdom. First of all, there's a group of people, right? You've got a group of people that, that make up uh, this kingdom. They're citizens in the kingdom. They're, uh, they're part of the kingdom. They provide some sort of value there. There's a purpose. Uh, that they have a reason for existing. They have even their own culture, if you will, their own, uh, uh, their own uh, way of functioning. We as Canadians, I, I think, are becoming much more distinct from our American brothers and sisters. Don't you think? Don't you want that to be true? I think it's becoming very clear that we're a little different, that, that we've got our own culture. Um, it's a very apologetic culture. We're sorry for that. Uh, but, we're but we're passionate about that. Um, that we have uh, certain practices that, that, that remind us of, uh, of our citizenship. Uh, we have rhythms that we participate in. And, and when I think about uh, a kingdom uh, and about God's kingdom, those four things are very clear. Uh, uh, very clear that they make up uh, this kingdom as well. That there's a certain number of people. These are individuals who have Christ in common and, aware, and are aware that they are new creations. We are all diverse. Diverse by personality, diverse by upbringing. There is represented in our church five generations. Okay? Um, different backgrounds, different creeds, different races all have what in common? The confession of Jesus. You know, that we're actually living out uh, that passage in Revelation that every tongue will confess and every knee will bow from every tribe and every uh, tongue that Jesus Christ is Lord. That's our common confession. There's a lot of richness in that. Now, we want to be able to bring uh, those group of people together united, united uh, by our union with Jesus. Uh, we believe that we have a purpose, that we are disciples who make disciples, that we're a part of something bigger than any one of us, um, that we exist to advance the kingdom. And sometimes that goes well, sometimes that's really hard but that we exist to advance this kingdom. Uh, that we do it by certain rhythms, certain practices. We celebrate with one another. We worship with one another. We uh, fellowship with one another. We connect with one another. That we have a certain number of rhythms and of practices, and, and we do so by a, a certain level of power. You know, when I watch those movies, um, there's always a war that's taking place, right? And, and there's... There's certain nations that have more power than others. We are a nation with this incredible power, the power of the Spirit, by the gospel of Jesus Christ, that we believe destroys strongholds, that we believe uh, destroys sin and addiction, that we believe frees us from guilt and shame, that we might live the way God intended us to live. Um, in redemptive power. That's a, that's a wonderful thing, and that's, that's, these, these are the resources that God has given us. He's given us people, He's given us purpose, He's given us practices, He's given us this power, so that we can see the advancement take place. And so, whatever ministry, we're thinking about this. We're thinking about how we can move people forward. Uh, if you're in a life group, um, uh, I love that. I think that's a great uh, picture of what we're talking about here. You exist for a reason. That is to build up the saints in the work of the ministry so that they can go uh, and share that with others. Uh, as you facilitate the rhythms, um, all 
of those have a reason. And we need to remind people of that what we do, that everything we do has a reason. Um, that's how we structured our services here at Sam and Arm. It's with a reason. And, and what I want people to see is that there's the truth of the gospel, even in how we do some things. That we pass together, that we fellowship together, that um, we worship together. But how we do that actually proclaims the truth. One of the things that we do here uh, is that we take our worship and we kind of make it at the end of the service. Anybody know why we do that? Kind of a call to it. Anybody? I know, it kind of leaves you with a spirit of worship, like yep. God, like it's not, like we just heard the sermon and then we just community it gives us yeah it gives us an experiment it gives us you're right you're right Leslie because it gives us an experience of God not just an intellectual interaction with God it actually takes the truth into our hearts that we might be strengthened and empowered going now uh, I, we live by the conviction that theology always leads to doxology okay and we live by the conviction that nobody really wants to come to church. Okay, that if given over to our flesh on a Sunday morning, now we won't really want to come. So we need to come and we need to have our hearts and our minds penetrated by the gospel and be reminded of why we were created to worship. And that's why we put the, the message at the front end so that it's expressed in worship in response to that and we live uh, in the confidence of that. It's a simple little thing, but it's an important thing, even in how we structure our service. Um, I'm going to steal something from yours. Is that okay? Yeah. Jordan he has this Andy Stanley quote in his that says, the church's job to is to move people from the foyer to the living room to the kitchen. Mm -hmm. Think about that for a second. Mm -hmm. okay? That's the expression of true community. Because it's getting people from a whole group gathering into smaller groups where we're taking study and, and our and our mutual love of God's Word, but that there's something very powerful and profound about it. Uh, once that happens, and that trust has been built, having life talked about in kitchens. Um, whenever I visit Pollock's group, we never start on time. You notice that? Because it's like 45 minutes of hanging out in the kitchen, and it's awesome. It's wonderful, because those people love being together. They love talking about their weeds. When we're talking about the gospel mission. We're talking about it not as a task to be accomplished, but as a life to be lived with, in front of God and worship, and one another in community, and a watching world on a mission. The king in us needs to organize and structure our lives that way. And this is how we do that. I think uh, by communicating to our groups an understanding of why they're a part of this, that there's an agreement. Why are we here? What is the purpose of this? And it has to have a bigger picture, a missional purpose to it. Okay? That we're here to grow in our walk with Jesus uh, so that other people will meet him. Uh, that there are certain rhythms, an, expect, an expected activity with an understood purpose. Um, that people can predict what's going to happen in a group, but they know that it's not just uh, rote uh, activity, that it's not just things we do, it's actually uh, communicating a deeper purpose, like that idea of moving from foyer to the living room to the kitchen. Uh, there, there's reminders that we're always coming back to the why. That we're always reminding people of why we're here. And finally, that we're always keeping in the back of our minds multiplication. The church is both an organization and an organism. Um, organisms multiply and they grow. Uh, if we're truly on mission, we need to expect that things will grow. problem with growth is that it means things have to change, right? And that's sometimes what we resist. And what I hope is that as we're talking with people, and that as we're planning and preparing and dreaming the dreams that, that God has for us, we would keep multiplication in mind. That we would be looking for place, places to replicate ourselves. Uh, to start more children ministry groups. To start more life groups. To start and multiply redemption groups. That we're kind of thinking about those kinds of things that we don't get so locked into our thing, uh, that we become protective of it and defensive of it. Um, when we're defensive of things and overprotective, that's when things stop. Um, and, and I feel I need to say that because we're going to talk later on today, uh, when we talk about the prophet, when we talk about the priest, about ministering God's word into people's lives. 
But I love that we need to that we start with this, that it's for the big picture purposes. And that's kingdom and management. Any questions on anything I've fired at you? I hope I haven't offended. I I don't mean to downplay all this way at all. So I'm not going to call it that. But is there anything anything that I can answer for you? I like what you said about that phrase, ministering God's word in people's lives. Yeah. I mean, that, that's what it is. Yeah. As we live our day, that's, that's what it's for. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's the difference between reading God's word and God's word reading us. <laughs> right? That as we experience God through his word and we expect to hear from God, through His Word, and we expect it to touch something deep inside of us. There's always a great, God has something greater in mind with that too, which is to share it with other people. Yeah. Thanks, Joyce. Hmm. Yeah, we should take a picture of it and try to interpret it later. <laughs> yeah, I, I like layering the triangles, and, and I would have tried to do that, but it's really messy. <laughs> but but there's there's a unity to that, especially as we kind of um, narrow our focus, almost like a funnel, right? It starts with God, ends with people. Actually, that's a really good image, the funnel image. Um, and what we see is transformation in hearts uh, and God uh, using um, theology to do that. Yeah. Anything else? Are you before? We are recording this. Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah. Yeah. I fell asleep. No, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not even um, That's good. I'll pray, because we never know when something's over. And we'll pray in the church. Maybe we don't have to transition out of something. Um, so, I've said this to a few people. I served on the board of football and had to resist the temptation to close a meeting with prayer. <laughs> never know when it's over. But, okay, let's go now. <laughs> so I'm going to pray for you as you go. Does everybody know where they're going? Yeah. All right. Everyone's clear on what's happening? Where, where are the rooms? The rooms are this. Uh, Kirsten's going to be in here. Jordan's going to be in the prayer room, which is down the hall and around the maze. And Paul's going to be downstairs in the youth room. Okay? Um, does any of you guys know where that is? Just follow the lemmings, really. Um, and, uh, and I'll let you, I can help out with that. Father, thanks for this time. I pray that you'd be working in my heart um, uh, and in the hearts of those who are going to be leading up the breakout sessions, Paul and Kirsten and Jordan. Uh, and that, that there might be a connection with all of our hearts, that even as we sit and as we listen, uh, that you would be speaking something very profound to us about our ministries uh, and about your purposes. In your name I pray. Amen. <coughs>